And I think what, what I love, and, and this might help us get back to kind of inclusion in companies, is when we talk about inclusion, I think there's oftentimes a misunderstanding. I'd love to get your thought on this. I think for me, I think there's a misunderstanding of a lot of people think inclusion means we don't argue, we don't fight, and nobody brings up any issues. There's no tension. And I think inclusion is the exact opposite of that. It's I feel respected and the ability to share my opinion in the face of opposition. And I think that's really what we're looking for. And too often, we we have that close-knit group, right? That, that group of people who came over from the other company. We're like, they have great inclusion. They all get along and it's so fantastic. Well, actually, that's not what I want in a company. I want you to disagree and have you know actual communication so we're putting forward the best product. We're having the best processes because if no one, agree, no one disagrees because I like you and I may kind of disagree, but I, I kind of like you, so I'll let you get away with this. It doesn't actually help us get to the best product. So I think that's such an excellent point. Yeah. And I think when I really liked what you said, because I think when we talk about how do we train organizations um, to be inclusive and to have diverse workforces, we focus on things like unconscious bias and sourcing for diversity, all good things. But there's some foundational elements there, which are how do you have difficult conversations? How do you communicate with people who have a different style of communication from you? How do you um, you know, challenge people in an effective way and, and, and live that value of respect and create that psychological safety for people. That's where a lot of that foundational training has to happen. And then you can layer on, you know, unconscious bias and some of these other things. I think that's such a good point. You have to have a way uh, to monitor your own growth. Like that's what I hear from that is like, if you're, I think of allyship, right? I think a lot of, um, white males, male people on, on any spectrum, you know, white women, everyone who's trying to support the other people around them and make sure they feel welcome and included. Part of the onus is on you. And part of that is really having an understanding of what are you doing in meetings that could be uh, doing it. Cause I think sometimes like I might have a communication style that's just dominant in conversation. Like I just want to get my idea out and understanding like how my conversational style impacts everyone's conversation can help. Like there might be a time and place for how I'd like to communicate, but also altering my communication style. So other people, or also using it as support when someone might be being talked over or having their ideas stolen in a meeting is actually a better use for the same skill that then also supports my colleagues, also supports better ideas. But I think that's such a, such an excellent point. It's something I definitely had to train myself because um, if you haven't guessed it, I love to hear myself talk. I love to be the center of attention. Uh, and so, yeah, and like you, I get really excited and I can dominate the conversation. And as a leader, when I had recruiting teams, you know, sometimes I became uncomfortable with silence. You know, I would want to just jump in and, and recognizing that, People have different ways of processing information. Sometimes if you just let it sit, you know, count to 10, someone else will join in. And so yes. I think um, when we're talking about inclusion, we aren't just talking about, okay, well, we, might, we need to make sure that we include women in the conversation or people of color. Um, it's everyone. It's people who have a diverse or different way of um you know, communication or comfort level speaking up in a group and how do we create different avenues for those people to have their ideas heard and their opinions shared. That's such a good point. I know some of the most brilliant people are the people that comment in the chat, but never say anything. Like they just have beautiful messages. Maybe they don't like public speaking, but I think it's so important to, I think, take the moment and say what's in the chat. So it's a part of the group. If that's how people prefer to communicate, I think that's, that's so great. But I think one of the things that I want to zoom in there on is making mistakes. What that reminded me of is like, it was in a podcast. I literally made a mistake where I started a podcast. I had someone uh, who had a disability and I started by saying, you know, oh, so-and-so let's talk about people with disabilities, right? I assumed the term for the person I was having a conversation with instead of asking the person, what term did you prefer? And so I just stopped the conversation. Like, look, I am so incredibly sorry that I used, that I like assume the term what term do you actually, and it didn't dawn on me until we were in the conversation and he used the term that I didn't. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. But it, he did, he wasn't, he wasn't frustrated. He wasn't angry. He was actually thankful that like I stopped the conversation and was okay being embarrassed and being in the wrong to correct it. I think that is something that, that I don't see a lot of people doing it. What stories do you have of, of people who, who've made mistakes and, and done stuff like that? Well, you're actually jumping ahead to my missing piece. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
what I think one of the missing pieces in our conversations as a society and as a company around DEI is fear. I think people are so afraid to make mistakes because topics around diversity are often politicized. We're a litigious society. Um, And I think people are afraid to say the wrong thing. They're afraid to leave out a letter in LGBTQ. They're afraid, do I call somebody black or do I call them African American? Uh, You know, so they don't want to offend people. And because of this, we don't say things. Because of this, we don't have hard conversations. And uh, this inhibits progress. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I have my own story of a huge mistake, a very public mistake that I made in an organization that was incredibly mortifying and painful at the time, um, and uh, but had a nice outcome. So uh, I was leading sort of a internal initiative on DE and I. We wanted to it was a group of um, people who were excited about talking around diversity, and we thought we would um, do celebrate diversity for a month, and we would invite people through our organizations to come and share at our weekly all hands about their heritage, ethnicity, gender, whatever it is, um, and how it influenced their journey growing up and in their career and anything that they wanted us to know about it. And we thought it'd be great to hear personal stories. So we threw it out there to the organization and we literally got one volunteer. That volunteer happened to be a cis white male who wanted to talk about Christianity. And yes, I paused and I was like, is this a good idea? And I went back to our little diversity committee, which also happened to be all white women. And uh, we were like, okay, well, you know what? Inclusion means we include everybody. So let's hear from this individual. And he gave his presentation at the next All Hands. And the feedback was fast and it was passionate. People were really confused how we could be touting Celebrate Diversity, and our first speaker was a white man talking about Christianity. Mm -hmm. They thought, does this organization not understand the challenges that marginalized communities have in the workplace, in their lives? Um, They didn't, weren't comfortable with the topic of Christianity. And uh, people were mad, and they were hurt. And we heard about it. Uh, I felt really badly that I'd hurt people. And I thought my career was over. Uh, I really did. It was a terrible experience. But what happened was I started to have conversations with the people who were giving feedback and who were impacted and listening. And honestly, being super open about the fact that I screwed up. And maybe it wasn't a great idea to have a group of white women leading, like that all look the same, leading our diversity initiatives. And um, that we don't know everything. Uh, We aren't, you know, we all want to appear like experts, but, you know, there's so much I don't know. And I have so much to learn. And there were some very real conversations, not just between me. It really inspired conversations across the entire organization. It did inspire more people to share their stories. And um, I think it was out of that was the most authentic, authentic conversations we've had around DEI. It was painful, but I actually ultimately think that it pushed us forward. And so we have to give each other grace, mm-hmm. give ourselves grace, give others grace to make those mistakes, but learn from them and change their behaviors as a result. Yeah, Rachel, I think that's such a special story for a couple of reasons. Number one, you're incredibly special. I think it's very rare to have someone who can authentically be in this space of like, I'm sorry, authentically, I am sorry. And how can I make this right? Because it's one thing to be authentically sorry, right? Because a lot of people are authentically sorry because it makes them uncomfortable. Not very many people are authentically sorry like you are, Rachel, which is like, I'm sorry because it hurt you. And how can I make it right? I think that's something that that is crucial to the situation. Like, And I think it's good for our listeners to know it's okay to make mistakes. In fact, you're going to make mistakes. That's going to happen. That is inevitable. But you have to be able to, to not try to take away people's right to be angry, right to be frustrated, and meet them where they're at and try to move forward from that. And 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 just you, you can only control yourself, right? And the grace, I think that's such a such a great story. 